Hello and welcome to another program of Study the Word. We bring this to you every week by the River Ridge Church of Christ that meets in Newburgh, Indiana. 5600 Van Road. It's 10 minutes from I-69. We hope you can come and be with us. Folks, do check out our website. We have many Bible study helps there. Of course, the big one is that you can watch our services live as we stream them over the internet. We upload our past TV programs. We upload uh, bulletins from the past. Of course, you can be put on the mailing list if you would like that. You can listen to our radio program through our website if you're out of the listening area. So go ahead, take a look at our website, and you can see it there at the bottom of your screen. We'll show it uh, from time to time throughout the program today. The big thing is you'll notice the phone number that will appear. Again, we show that throughout the program just as a reminder so that you know where you can call to get Bible information. You have a Bible question on your mind? Let us know. We can give you an answer, we can send material to you, and of course we can even use it on these TV programs. We often say a question that's on your mind, chances are it's on the minds of other people. So. Please take note of that phone number. You may get me live or you may go ahead and catch me um, while I'm somewhere else and you can listen, leave your message on voicemail. And um, also request copies of our TV program. We save them on DVD. All right, now we're gonna get into this week's Bible question that relates to something we started a couple weeks ago. Um, uh, I do apologize, you know, we started three weeks ago a series on worship. What are the acts of worship? And we did a couple of them, and then we got preempted by uh, another Bible question. See, folks, I knew that this series on worship would take at least six lessons. And so if somebody calls in a question, I didn't want them to have to wait a, a month and a half before we would deal with it on our program. So if you've got a question, we'll go ahead and put you to the top of the list and we'll deal with it right away. Uh, but we're going to go back and, and, and resume where we left off. And if you didn't see those programs, boy, you really need to see them. Um, you can go to our website or you can go ahead and request a copy of them. We started off talking about what is biblical worship and the importance of worshiping God. And then we proceeded to point out that the Christians in the first century, when they came together, they performed five acts of worship. Every time they came together as a church, on the first day of the week, on Sunday, there were five things that they did that were approved by God. And being approved by God is essential, which was the first lesson we did on how that there is such thing as a vain worship. Uh, you know, useless worship. People think, listen, if I'm coming together and, and worshiping God, it doesn't matter what I do. That's not true. And we pointed out the problems with that. Um, whatever we do in worship must be in spirit and in truth, John chapter 4 and in verse 24. It's good that you have your heart in it, but if it's not approved of God, it, it's not good. And at the same token, you could be doing the right thing, but your heart is not in it and that's not going to accomplish anything anyway or either so after we did that introductory lesson the first act of worship that we spent time talking about was the Lord's Supper what is the Lord's Supper what are the emblems what does it mean do you have to do it every first day of the week well that's what we dealt with and if you missed that please go ahead and request that lesson so what's the other act of worship that we're going to be talking about today well Today we're going to be talking about the importance of singing. What does that mean? We're going to answer questions that pertain to it. Um, are you allowed to use instruments? Or can we have a choir? Can we have people get up and, and give a solo? And so on. So on. So we're going to deal with all those aspects of singing. So we hope you'll stay tuned for the next half hour. All right. So let's talk a little bit about singing. Well, the Christians in the first century were commanded to sing when they came together as an act of worship. Let me begin by reading a couple of passages, one in Ephesians, and then Paul wrote the same thing over in the book of Colossians. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, Paul wrote, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and make melody in your hearts to the Lord. Now, I want to stress that. 
that worship is always for the Lord. Now, there are benefits that we receive, obviously, by worshiping God. We get to have fellowship with our brothers and sisters. We can be strengthened. We can be encouraged. We can draw closer to God. Yes, there's a lot of personal benefits from that. But you notice that worship is primarily for God. In our singing, we teach and admonish one another. In Colossians chapter 3, he mentions the same thing in verse 16, where Paul said, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace, grace in your hearts to the Lord. Again, yes, we sing to one another, but it's for the Lord. Worship is for God. Now, even within those couple of verses, we've learned a lot. Number one is that we're going to get together and we're going to sing spiritual songs. We're not going to get together and sing, row, row, row your boat. Um, when we come together, we're going to praise God. We're going to sing those spiritual songs to the Lord. Now, having said that, these verses answer some of the things that I mentioned just a moment ago. Well, can we have a choir? Can we have somebody get up and and sing a solo. Well, the passages that we just read here, when the church comes together, it says speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Everybody is singing praises to God and teaching one another at the same time. There's no biblical authority for a choir. There's no biblical authority for somebody singing a solo. Um, Again, getting back to this idea of that when the church comes together, they sing. If you recall, a couple weeks ago when we did the lesson on taking the Lord's Supper, why am I bringing that up? Well, if you remember, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he said in Matthew chapter 26 and in verse 29 that he was going to drink it with his children in his kingdom. And of course, his kingdom has been established. And the fact that the church today gathers to remember the Lord's death, we commune with him. Now, you'll see where I'm going with this in just a few moments. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16, it says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not communion of the body of Christ? We commune with our Lord, which he promised which he said he would do in the kingdom, and the kingdom is here, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. So, the church and the word kingdom are used synonymously. So why am I talking about this idea that when we come together and we take the Lord's Supper, we commune with Christ? Well, it's because Christ is among us, and he promised that he would, he would be with us. In uh, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 26, Jesus says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. And so Jesus is present. Now this leads up to a passage over in Hebrews chapter 2 as we're talking about the importance of singing. In Hebrews chapter 2, um, he was talking about Christ and his brethren. In verse 11 it says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing praise to you. See, within the congregation, Christ is praising the Father with us, and we're all singing together. Okay, obviously Jesus spiritually, but the point is, the church sings praises to God when we come together and when we worship. We need to remember that. Now when it comes to singing, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 15, notice we're using a lot of verses here. Please do not hesitate to call and say, I would like a copy of today's program on DVD. Just leave your name and your address and I'll mail it out to you at no charge. And we want to thank all our viewers who have been calling up recently and and requesting copies of our DVD and telling us how much or how often they watch our program. And, and it is encouraging. It's good to know that there are people like you that are interested in learning the truth because there is so much 
confusion. There's so much false teaching being taught today, and especially on this particular subject, because people don't want to stay just with the Word of God. Okay, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it tells us in verse 15, what is the result then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I also will sing with the understanding. You see, back when we studied this a few weeks ago, we looked at Matthew chapter 15 and verses 7 through 9, where Jesus talked about people drawing near to him with their lips, but their heart is far from them. When we come together and worship God and we sing praises, we need to understand what we're singing. That's the key. Sing with the understanding. Just don't go through the motions. You know, there's times where you can just sing a song and you don't even remember what you just said. Worship is to be taken seriously. We are to be thinking what we're doing. Not only when we take the Lord's Supper, which we studied, and the other three acts of worship that we will study in weeks to come, Lord willing. But we've talked about the Lord's Supper and today we're talking about the importance of singing when we come together uh, as a church and we worship God. And one of those acts of worship is singing. Now there's something that we haven't talked about yet that I, we need to spend a little bit of time on. And this is going to pertain to a lot of studies we've had on the past. If you've been a regular viewer, I have mentioned one of the biggest problems that we have in the spiritual realm today is people not understanding the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I don't want to go over that again. I'd be glad to send you some material or DVDs on this. But we're not under the old law. All you have to do is read Hebrews chapters 8 and verse 9, or chapter 9. Because within those two chapters, you will learn that Jesus brought a New Testament. And you can't have a New Testament without the death of a testator. And so we're under the New Covenant. Jesus nailed the old law to the cross. The old law for the Jews, the new law for everybody. Read that in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. So why am I talking about people not understanding the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Well, here's the reason. Because when you talk about the importance of singing and understanding worship, people will often ask me, Chuck, is instrumental music authorized in the New Testament for worship? And the answer is no. It's not authorized. See, Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 says, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ. Jesus has all the authority. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. Jesus has all the authority. And Jesus is the head of the church. His church. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Now remember, our very first study on worship. Worship must be God, done God's way. We went all the way back to the Old Testament to notice an example, and then we noticed some examples in the New Testament where people were worshiping their way and not the Lord's way, and it wasn't being accepted. We went way back and talked about Cain and Abel. How Cain offered a sacrifice for God, and so did Abel. One was accepted, and one was not. One got angry, the other one did not. Who got angry? The one who expected his worship to be accepted to God, but it wasn't accepted by God. Today, people get upset today too. Oh, don't tell me God doesn't accept my worship. Listen, I can't tell you what God accepts or what God rejects without going to the Word of God. I know what the will of God is. That's why we're told to study. This program is called Study the Word. If you have a, a biblical question, you deserve a biblical answer. And what does the Bible teach about instrumental music? Well, we already read clearly in Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians chapter uh, 3, where it said what? Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, I'm, I'm knowing to say a lot in the pulpit, if you've ever watched our services streamed, I say it time and time again, that most often when you get into a religious discussion where there's disagreement, so often the discussion or argument isn't over what the Bible says, 
it's usually over Y. And that'll get you in trouble all the time. Let me illustrate that with what we're talking about today. When I've often been in, in Bible studies and talking about this very subject, about instrumental music and worship today, I will ask usually the person that thinks it's okay, I will ask them, am I sinning if I don't use instrumental music in worship? And they'll say, oh no, absolutely not. There's, the Bible says sing, you're not singing. And, but they'll say, but we don't see why we can't use instrumental music. You see, it isn't over what the Bible says, it's over why. Why can't we? And when you start doing that, you're going to get yourselves into all kinds of trouble. Whether well, the Lord's Supper. I know it says to use unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. Why can't we use a candy bar and um, some uh, soda pop? Why can't we? People say, oh, Chuck, you're just being silly. No, no, I'm not being silly. I'm, I'm going to tell you straight up that if, if instrumental music's okay, then we can change other aspects of worship that we're going to be talking about in weeks to come. Because people will say, well, I don't see why we can't. Our Lord took care of the problem of understanding what we need to do by simply telling us what we need to do. He told us to sing. And we sing praises unto God. Now I've heard all kinds of arguments that we're going to present now where people think that this proves that you're allowed to use instrumental music. Number one is people will often go to the Old Testament. Why are you going to the Old Testament? We're not under the Old Testament anymore. We're not under the Old Law. People say, well, Chuck, uh, there's some things that we find that are taught under the Old Law that are taught under the New Law. Well, that's true. Under the Old Law, you're not to steal. You're not to lie and of course that's taught under the gospel also but just because you've got those similarities doesn't mean you're under the old law because we know that those old testament laws are not binding today all of them you say well chuck are you saying some of those old testaments are buying old testament laws are binding today well no they're not binding because they're under the old law they're binding because they're under the gospel the new covenant you need to see the difference if you don't see the difference we're going to have all kinds of problems people say well chuck wasn't you know, does, didn't, why would you say God doesn't approve of something that he once approved of? Well, there's lots of things that God once approved of and commanded that he doesn't today. I mean, you can go back and read where God commanded Abraham to be circumcised and his offspring. Um, you'll see where Moses, under the law of Moses, was commanding the Israelites that at eight days, the male child was to be circumcised. It was a command. Matter of fact, when Moses didn't have his son uh, circumcised when God wanted him to, God sought to kill him. And so then they took care of it, and they circumcised his son. So we can see where God commanded it, expected it, and wanted it. But then you get over to Galatians chapter 5 and read the first four verses, where the Apostle Paul says that if you teach circumcision, you have fallen from grace. You've been, you have separated yourself from Jesus Christ. What? I mean, God once commanded something, and now if you do make it a law that you're sinning? Yes. Folks, and, that, and that's just one of many that we can come up with. So you can't use that as proof by saying, well, under the old law, they use instrumental music. That doesn't prove it. You have to go to the New Testament for biblical authority. That's the key. So that's just not going to work. And then people will say, well, Chuck, I've done an extensive study in, in Ephesians chapter 5, and when you look at the word psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, the definition of the word psalm, you can look at all these definitions. What does psalm mean? And one of the definitions way down, it says, to pluck, you know, when you sing. It means within the, within the heart. Pluck as, as is as in an instrument. There you go. What do you mean there you go? You know, he's, he's, he's using a definition, and one of the definitions implies that singing is like plucking as in an instrument. So they need to be careful, because what they're trying to use as proof is now is commanding everybody, everywhere, to play an instrument. Do they teach that? You see, if they want to force that definition, and it means literally that everybody's to pluck an instrument, rather than describing how that we sing praises to God, they're now using an argument that is forcing them 
to have every member and every every Christian to play an instrument while they sing. And who teaches that? Nobody teaches that that I know of. Okay? And even if they do teach that, it's wrong. Okay? Now, is singing only when the church comes together? Well, no. There are times when you can sing. I mean, when a person is happy, the scripture says, let, let him sing praises to God. I like what you have over here in Acts chapter 16 and in verse 25. It says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas, here they were, they were cast into prison after being beaten. Okay. And Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. They weren't singing and playing. No instrument. And by the way, instruments were introduced by religious groups later on. The early church didn't have them. And even churches of Christ. You could say, Chuck, I know a church of Christ that has instruments. They have a band that gets up there and play. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Churches of Christ, even in the first century, were drifting away. And Paul had to write them letters to get them back on track. They were drifting away. You read the seven churches of Asia. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you're going to find five of those seven churches were rebuked for things. And they were told to repent. What if they didn't repent? Well, they, they had totally gone off then. And they've rejected the Lord. And they're just a religious group now. They're not the church you read about in the Bible. And so you're going to find people that are going to say, well, it's okay. It was introduced by man. It wasn't like that in the beginning. And folks, today, we are to sing praises. Now what happens is, and we touched on this at the beginning of our program, is people are turning worship into something that is for man and not for God. And that's why you have all sorts of entertainment today. It's nothing but a... Um, going to like a concert. As a matter of fact, some religious groups advertise it as a concert. And they'll advertise some group that is coming and they're going to be playing and they'll advertise that and they'll fill their buildings. I know because people want to be entertained. That doesn't surprise me. People want things for themselves and they, they don't think about the Lord. And that's what happened when Jesus fed the 5,000 and the next day they came looking for him and Jesus said, you seek me. Well, that sounds right. No. He said, you seek me. Not because of the miracle, but because you want your bellies filled. See, they didn't learn from the example of Jesus. Jesus wasn't performing a miracle just for the sake of performing a miracle. Yes, they, they, they were fed, but he wanted them to listen to what he had to say. And it wasn't going to be a practice of his to always provide food for them. That was just a, a, an opportunity that he used to perform this miracle, to confirm who he was so that people would listen. And that didn't impress the people as far as listening to what he had to say. They just wanted to go and get another free meal. And folks, let's face it, that's what's going on today. You religious groups out there that have the entertainment, take the entertainment away. See how many people come. Seriously. Take away the choirs. Take away the solos and have the members all together sing praises to God without the instrument and just from the heart praise God in song. People say, well, they would still do that. Then do it. But no, because they want to do it because it makes them feel good. I've had people tell me, Chuck, you're not going to convince me about instrumental music being wrong because I love it. Well, I'm not going to argue with that. Lots of people do things in worship that they love. But when are they going to stop and say to themselves, what does God want? What is authorized? We need to have authority. Matthew chapter 21, they came to Jesus and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And Jesus would have gladly answered them after they, they were to answer his questions, but they wouldn't answer his questions, so he did not answer theirs. By what authority are you doing things? And people are doing things today, and when you ask them where's your authority, they'll say, well, our church authorizes it. Church has no authority. Jesus has all the authority. So the church doesn't have the authority to change worship, to add things or take away from it. And so Christians come together on the first day of the week and they sing praises to God in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, teaching and admonishing one another. 
to show you how bad things have gotten. And it's been bad for a long time. I remember attending, I used to belong to a denomination until I had learned the truth. But I thought I had the truth. But I, I can recall going to a denomination and a gentleman getting up and he's playing an instrument. And they said, so and so is now going to play and this is the title of the song, it was some spiritual name, you know, Praises to the Lord. But there were no words, it was just an instrument. Here he was just playing an instrument. Sometimes people play, you know, a, a piano, and they'll just play a melody. And they'll give that melody a religious title. But there's no words to it. And I'm sitting there thinking, why is this person, we're all listening, he's just playing a melody, there are no words, and this is called praising God? Folks, that's what's happened. People have gotten away from the word, and so nothing surprises me anymore. When you do one thing without biblical authority, you'll do another thing without biblical authority. You have people not keeping the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. They're not doing it the way the Lord intended. And of course you have people not singing the way the Lord intended intended. And this is why we have this program. Now next week we're going to look at another act of worship. There were five things that the church did when the, you know, when the Christians came together as a church. The local church did these five things on the first day of the week. We noticed that you could take, you could sing other days of the week. Paul and Silas were in prison. It wasn't a Sunday and they were just singing. You can sing anytime praises to God. So don't get me wrong, but I do know that when you come together as a church, one of the acts of worship is we sing. So I hope this helps. If you have any other questions pertaining to this, don't hesitate to call. We'd be glad to send you some information and give you an answer. And uh, we hope you'll be back here next week. Once again, we'll open up our Bibles and study together. Folks, don't forget, tomorrow night, we're going to have a Q&A, a question and answer period, from 7 to 8 at the Newburgh Library. Um, I'll be there, look for a little red sign that's sitting on the table there that has a Q and an A on it. Just wander over and listen. We'll be just studying the scriptures together in an informal manner. So please mark that down, Newburgh Library, just off of Sis Sis Highway 66, um, off of Bell, behind Hardy's. And on Tuesday nights, 7 to 8, at the Chick-fil-A, the east side uh, Chick-fil-A, over there by um, Outback and... Um, some of those other restaurants there. But we'll be at the Chick-fil-A Tuesday nights from 7 to 8 for another question and answer period. We just want to help you become familiar with the Word of God. Don't forget our radio program Sunday afternoons at 2 from 2 to 2.30 on 98.5 FM. We'd love to hear from you. Please don't hesitate to email us or call us or even visit us. We'd love to have you come and assemble with us. So we brought to you by the River Ridge Church of Christ. 5600 Van Road in Newburgh. Thank you folks and have yourselves a great day.